education. And there aren't too many people on the planet right now that are trained uh, with the skill to even uh, identify this under the microscope. Um, but this is really important. So I'll give you an example here. Um, I like taking reishi. Um, I don't like taking all types of reishi. Ganoderma tsuge doesn't sit with me very well. It's very abundant in my area, but my body doesn't really like it. Um, my body likes Ganoderma sessile. It's in my area, less abundant than the tsuge, but my body reacts to it a little bit better. Um, so this might be the case with cordyceps, and currently the only domestic available cordyceps are militaris. Um, and I think that, I know that, as we move into the next couple years, more and more research will be done and more and more individuals will be working with other species of cordyceps um, and discovering all new medicinal benefits um, that may be more beneficial to different people. Um, so that's really, really exciting. I'm actually uh, gonna be flying out to Puerto Rico next month um, to search El Yunque National Forest for Cordyceps Taco Montana. Um, to hopefully bring that into cultivation and discover uh, new medicinal properties so that maybe somebody that's not getting the benefits from cordyceps or cordyceps doesn't work for them right now may find uh, more benefit in another species. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the life, si life cycle of cordyceps militaris. Uh, this picture is from 1837. Um, I like to remind myself that uh, before we had screens in our face all the time, um, that we were more inclined to be observant of the world around us. Um, so, because it, it, it kind of struck me um, that we're still learning so much about cordyceps, but somebody in 1837 did a microscopic, uh, accurate picture of the parathecium. So the parathecium are bumps um, that are found on the top of the cordyceps mushroom. Um, um, uh, with macroscopically, they look like bumps. Uh, microscopically, they look like little pores. Um, and inside of those, they're lined with uh, as ascus, or look like smaller cups that produce uh, the ascospores, uh, which are made up of smaller part spores. It's kind of fractal. Um, and uh, these things break off really easily. Um, I have this theory that it's kind of like a fruit meant to be broken off and moved throughout the, the, the forest to spread its seed. Um, so yeah, we'll get a little bit more heady first before we get into the cool pictures and stuff like that. Um, cordyceps sex life is pretty interesting. It took me a while to figure out what this all is. Uh, they are bipolar heterotholic in their sexual preferences, um, and they're also anamorphic. Um, they can completely change into a different species, um, depending on environmental stimuli. Um, and I had a conversation with Daniel Winkler. Um, if that name is unfamiliar to you, I would recommend that you familiarize yourself with that name. Um, Daniel Winkler is another cordyceps expert, um, and uh, he is um, my senior. He's, he's uh, older than me, has more experience than me, and has uh, lent me a lot of his wisdom. Um, and he explained to me that the Ophiocordyceps sinensis in Tibet uh, has been observed to also be anamorphic, um, and it'll morph into an endophytic fungus. Endo meaning inside, phytic, phyte meaning plant. Um, so it'll morph into a fungus that lives inside of a plant instead of a fungus that is parasit parasitic to an insect. Um, where this got more interesting to me and made more sense to the cordyceps that I familiarized myself with uh, was when he told me that it becomes an endophyte uh, that lives inside of the plant that, it, that is the host plant of the caterpillar that is the host species of the cordyceps. So you're thinking this mushroom is so tiny in a big world and it's trying to land on a moving food target and it takes two spores of, of mating compatibility. So it's a possibility that two boys land on the, on the caterpillar. They can't make fertile offspring. It's a possibility two girls land on the, on the caterpillar. They can't make fertile offspring. It's a possibility that none of the spores land on any insect, um, and how are they going to get on there? So they have these interesting mechanisms of how they uh, manage to get themselves through uh, the ecosystem. And cordyceps militaris will morph into two different soil molds, Simplicillum and Lacanicillum. Um, and it'll change its sexual function from producing stromata with uh, ascospore uh, to producing canidia spore, like a mold like you would see on bread. Um, like how the molds on bread are all green. There's my white mycelium underneath there. They're producing their spore bodies on top of the mycelium. Uh, so this is what cordyceps will do. And these two so, uh, molds are common soil molds. Uh, common soil molds in the forest where we find the pupa that bury themselves uh, and become the host of the cordyceps mushroom. So um, I believe that this is one of the ways that they get themselves um, into contact with their host uh, whenever the spores uh, aren't able to land on a host species. Um, and just to finish that off, it takes two mating compatible strains. Um, there are, Cordyceps has two mating types and one of them has two variants. Um, 
and you have to make sure that if you're reading or, 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 or I mean, that's really the only time where it would be necessary unless you're just studying the ecological life cycles, um, that you put two mating compatible spores. I have Parathesium germinating on agar. This is how I initially started breeding. I was doing interbre or, yeah, interbreeding. I was inbreeding. I was, I was only breeding with uh, the same genetics because I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know what I was doing. Um, and I, all I knew is that the spores propagating would give me refreshed genetics. So I just kept inbreeding them. And I found out it would take like three or four generations before they started getting pretty mutated. Um, so I stopped doing inbreeding uh, in like 2018 uh, as when, as a community, we started to develop better breeding uh, protocol and linguistics. Um, so here, um, and I'd recommend you guys checking out um, my Instagram and I'll post another, I'll post some new videos on YouTube once I'm done traveling. Um, but I have a really cool video that we got last month or the month before of spores ejecting out of a parathesium that I put onto a, a petri dish. It looked like a poop. It just like was like real slow coming out at first, and then once that big one came out, it was like do -do 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 -do, like a bunch of them just like shot out like a little like a little uh, assault rifle or something. I was thinking it would be cool to like um, set up like a little animation of like zooming into a cordyceps spore, and they're just like a little mushroom man with a turret instead of shooting bullets, it's shooting out like cordyceps spores. Um, I thought that'd be pretty cool. Um, but yeah, so we have this spore here germinate. Um, so this is a full spore. Um, and, and what we're seeing is a two-dimensional image um, that as I move up and down through my microscope, it shows me depth and dimension. I can see through it almost. Um, so it's coming out in three dimensions with, all, with, the, with the mycelial threads coming out of all of the whole spore. Um, and it's my job as a cordyceps breeder, as a cordyceps farmer, as a, as a, um, uh, a cordyceps sommelier, uh, and uh, some, uh, somebody interested in procuring the, the finest cordyceps in the land uh, to isolate these, um, to make sure that we have them isolated um, so that uh, we can figure out which ones have the best potentials uh, for cultivation or for aesthetics or for medicinal compounds. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why you would want to grow them. It's not always just for the fruiting bodies. Um, so our quest starts with finding a parent strain. Because whenever I first started growing cordyceps mushrooms, um, there was no strains that you could buy in the United States that were capable of producing mushrooms. There was one strain available, it was $300, and it didn't produce mushrooms. Cordyceps uh, senesce faster than any mushroom I've ever witnessed. Uh, senescence, you can think of uh, senile humans. Uh, they lose their ability to, to function properly. And in uh, mushroom senescence, uh, they lose their ability to produce fruits. Um, so the mycelium can grow, but they won't produce any mushrooms. And this usually happens within nine to 12 months. Um, so you want to keep fresh cultures going. So in order to even get fresh cultures when I started, unless we're going to find a way to import them from other countries, I uh, was to find them in the wild. Um, the first specimen that I had from the wild was given to me by my friend Charlie Aller. He found it at um, my mushroom festival, MycoFest. If you're on the East Coast, better check that out next year. Um, uh, at MycoFest 2015, my buddy Charlie found a cordyceps milteris, which I didn't even know was uh, growing in Pennsylvania. I didn't know that it grew uh, in Pennsylvania. Um, and he gave it to me to clone. Um, and that's where it all started. Um, this story has been told a million times. If you wanted the full in-depth story, uh, check out, just look up my name and look up cordyceps. You'll find a bunch of podcasts. Everybody asks me the same questions all the time, so it's generally any of them will have that story. Um, so, uh, I just want to make sure I give you guys the best information in this hour, and that story is not the best information. Um, but we got the cordyceps in 2015 and cloned it, and that's what started the, uh, the genetics and started the cordyceps culture um, in the English-speaking world, um, was whenever, we got the, whenever I got that in 2015, shared it, and started cultivating it with my buddy Ryan Gates in uh, Michigan. Um, so we'll go out uh, into the beautiful forests of Pennsylvania um, in, um, it's a month before August, uh, July. Yeah, in July, uh, these start growing in July. Um, and then they'll keep growing until like the end of October. And uh, we'll find them in hemlock forests. Um, and it's, we're in a really interesting point right now because the hemlocks are dying off because of woolly adelgid in the East Coast. But um, Penn State and a couple other universities are finding these pockets of resistant hemlocks that are that they're cloning and spreading out. Um, and the forest that we're finding cordyceps in 
seem to be pretty resistant, but it takes that hemlock because the trees don't drop their leaves, so all year that forest is not getting solar radiation blasted onto the soil. Solar radiation on the soil kills complex life. If you want complex life, it needs to be have some sunscreen on it. It needs to have some tree cover to protect it from the ultraviolet radiation. Two things that are most harmful to life is oxidation uh, and inflammation. So that, I mean, these are two things that will come from just being exposed to open environment. Um, so the hemlocks are beautiful protectors, angels of the forest. They keep it nice uh, and safe. They make that nice, beautiful little womb that these complex little organisms can pop out in. Um, and we tend to find them in that oak hemlock mix um, because the most common species that we're finding them on in the East Coast is uh, Anisota cenatoria, uh, which is the orange tip oak worm moth or oak moth. Um, um, but we're finding them on four different host species. Um, the only research on their host species is from Korea, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it's Asian, um, and most of the species are Korean, and documented about 40 or 50 different species. Um, but we're now estimating like 50 to 60 plus different host species because only one host species in the United States for Cordyceps militaris has been documented uh, with, with proper identification. Um, so I've been working on some protocol for um, isolating insect DNA, DNA away from the, the Cordyceps to be able to identify the insect from the little shell that's left over. Um, so we find them a little popping out of the ground. Um, oops. And uh, we dig them up with our fingers. Um, sometimes we'll use a little knife and cut around to make it easier to loosen up the soil. Um, and then we'll get like a little air squeezy thing to clean your camera screen off or your camera uh, lens off or a little brush uh, to brush off the dirt. Um, and then we'll keep them in little um, like bead boxes um, to keep them clean. Um, and we'll generally find them around moving water, creeks, um, and things like that. I feel like the spores have an easier time moving around with the current. Um, they'll generally just be uh, perched up right in the moss along the creeks. Um, and I can't say this is like a general rule, but from what I've seen, they'll be towards the creeks at the beginning of the season, and then they'll kind of go up towards the, up the tree line later on. But I'm finding, as I've been looking at it for more and more years, that they move entirely through the forest. They will like, like I was like, I'm gonna go back to my cordyceps spot, and my cordyceps spot is like now moved over like yards in a different direction. Um, so it's not always that they're producing in the same area. Um, and this makes sense to me because I mean, oak trees don't even drop their acorns this, every year in the same place. They'll move them different places, and this, you know, um, increases genetic diversity and you know moves the animals, wildlife around since the food's not in the same place. Um, so I think this is important. I think it's, uh, the, and, the, and part of the reason why this is a little bit more unique than other mushrooms is because it's not going to be on the same tree every year. It's the tree that the, the, the food is moving. Um, um, sometimes we'll find them, we mostly find them on pupa, sometimes we find them on larva, and uh, rarest is finding them on the full adult form. Um, and then we'll, you know, get them all cleaned up, keep them separated so the spores don't get all mixed up and it doesn't get dirt all over in the, on the parathecium, because we want the wild spores. The wild spores are the most valuable thing in the cordyceps industry right now. Um, this is a good day, uh, foraging cordyceps in Pennsylvania. Um, and, uh, you know, they're all nice and clean. We take that back, um, and this is a treasure trove of, of genetic diversity. Um, so there is, in the forest that I uh, hunt along uh, in, in central Pennsylvania, there is such an abundance of cordyceps that nobody would ever even find enough to put a dent in the population that there is out there. Um, you can seriously go do this every day on a good season uh, around where I live. Um, and uh, this is super, super important for um, medicine uh, and for, you know, uh, economics. Um, so if you don't want to go out or if you're not capable of going out um, to the areas to be able to find cordyceps, you can buy your strains um, from trusted sources. Um, the most trusted sources in the industry right now are uh, terrestrial fungi, uh, Appalachian Gold, uh, and then my company, Mycosymbiotics. Um, I'm not sure of any other people that are breeding. Oh, um, Mushroom Life. They, they have really good cultures as well. Um, so those are going to be like industry standard, like tried and true people that have been providing good genetics for the past half, four years, three, three, four years that we've been doing this. Um, next step, isolate spores from parents if you want to breed. Um, so this specifically, this next little portion that I'm going to be talking uh, is going to be breeding stuff. Um, and this doesn't apply to everybody. Not everybody needs to breed. Um, this whole 
um, culture uh, puts us in this mindset that we're all like nuclear and individuals and stuff like that. When we're not, we're a collective of organisms from this planet that is a collective organism. Um, but it get, it always it always uh, rings uh, true whenever we think of like um, why does everybody on the block in any given American neighborhood have a riding lawnmower or a lawnmower at all when there could be one per block that everybody uses, everybody maintains, and there's way less waste, way less production. You know, why does everybody? How many of you all have a HEPA filter? Why? Why? There's people around you that probably want to grow mushrooms too, that you could be nerding out with, and that could be sharing equipment that's expensive, and y'all could all be getting together as a collective and doing this work together and, and propagating more knowledge into the future faster. Um, it's open sourcing, you know, it's decentralizing, it's what we all need to do to move forward with happier, healthier communities. Um, aside from just cordyceps cultivation. There's not a need for everybody to be breeding. There's not a need for everybody to be producing spawn. You know, some, one, somebody could be breeding, somebody could be producing spawn, somebody could have the fruiting room. Why do we all try to do everything ourselves? It's not even, it's not necessary whatsoever. And you'll find more success with, with, with community. Legal issues, depending on your job. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I stay in the legal realm, you know. I'm brown, I got a kid, I'm not messing around with nothing. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's funny until you get arrested. Uh, so yeah, we isolate the ascospores. Um, and my, de my technique was kind of remedial. It's something that I developed um, from a technique I learned hanging out with Trad um, in South Carolina. I found a wild cordyceps back in like 2017 in, at the top of Mount Pisgah in North Carolina. And I really wanted to get a culture. I took it down to South Carolina with Trad. And he was like, stick it to the top of a Petri dish with some uh, Vaseline or something like that to get the spores. Uh, or he told me to do that with a different mushroom. And then I was like, all right, I got the cordyceps, let me do that with this. Um, so I stuck the cordyceps to the lid of the Petri dish with, a, with, a, with some uh, Vaseline. Um, and that's how I get the spores off. Um, and this is really important, that, that's why it's really important that you keep your mushrooms clean when you bring them inside because you don't want dirt falling in your, in your Petri dish. Um, and so what I'll do, I don't know why I keep jumping like that. What I'll do uh, is, it dep all right, so some cordyceps are more vigorous than others. Some will drop spores in like an hour. Some will drop spores, it'll take like three days. Um, so what I'll do is I'll look at it and you can visually see like a smear, like a, like a tr almost translucent smear. I'll do water agar with this, by the way. No nutrients, keep it clear. The, le the least amount of nutrients, the slower they'll germinate, the more time you have to get them out of there before they touch each other. Um, so you'll want to see how fast they're dropping spores. If they're dropping spores really fast, you're going to want to keep turning the petri dish lid um, so that the spores drop in different places. Um, and then once you start to see them drop and there's a lot of them on there, take the mushroom out and then I'll look and I'd rather, this would be better with a dissecting microscope, but when I first started doing this, I did, I just couldn't afford a dissecting microscope. So I had this uh, compound microscope I got off auction um, and I would scan around the edges of the spore drops for single spores. Um, when I find the single spores, I'll take a sterile scalpel and I'll poke it and I'll take it out. If you guys want to see this, I have hundreds of videos on YouTube for every single thing that I've done for everybody to do it too. That's so we can all get cooler shit happening faster. Um, so then we get these clean little ascospores growing. Um, and here is where there's some questions. One, was my little human brain and human eyes capable of isolating microscopic spores away from each other, or did I just put two together that are already bred with each other? Because as soon as two spores touch that are compatible, they've already bred. And when it's in a field of a bunch of them, there could be multiple spores that are connecting with each other already, and you have a whole bunch of genetics going on. Um, so you need to figure out, one, is it single? Two, what is it? Is it a boy or a girl? I gotta figure it out, because if I wanna mate them together, I need to know what I can put together. If you're doing this without DNA technologies, you're 50% 50, 50 of the time gonna be wasting petri dishes, 50% of the time is not gonna work. Unless, unless you have one or a couple single ascospores that are mating type confirmed by DNA, then you can always just test your new ones against those to see which ones are compatible or not. But doing the DNA route is the way that you're gonna waste the least amount of time and energy. Um, so um, I bought myself a mini PCR um, I think my code is Myco or Symbi or something like that. I'll put my code up at my uh, at the booth we have by the Sheridan. Um, but we're I'm affiliated with Mini PCR. I have a code to get a percentage off their uh, uh, polymerase chain reaction machines, like for community homes uh, scale DNA work. 
Um, so I'll extract DNA from the mycelium of the single ascospores. Uh, I'll amplify it, and then I'll, see, I'll use gel electrophoresis, which is this little glowy thing over here, to tell if it's a boy or a girl. Um, the, these little bands are visualizations of the DNA, um, and uh, the boy and girl have different amounts of genes in their sex gene. Um, so one will be in this little box, one will, I can visualize how many, uh, how many base pairs they have and I can see which one's bigger than the other one. And I can say this one's a boy, this one's a girl. Um, it's be, they're between like, I think there's like between 400 and 600 base pairs, I can't remember which one's which. Um, uh, so yeah, comp uh, combine opposing mating types. I have all this in information available online. Um, my book is free on the internet. Um, so yeah, combine opposing mating types. Uh, after I do that, I test these strains. Um, I look at the traits of the offspring. I try and figure out which parents are providing which um, traits. Um, see which traits are beneficial for what I want. Um, and now, with uh, collaboration with Midasin, who sponsored this, uh, we can look more in depth uh, or who helped sponsor the festival, we can look more in depth at what they're actually producing and stuff like that. Um, so that we can add that to the things that we look at when we breed. Um, so yeah, these two have a, a share a, sim a similar parent. They have one of the same parents. I have a lot of brothers and sisters, and if you saw them all, you probably never guessed that any of them were related to me. Um, because I, we all only share one parent. It's crazy how much variation you can have uh, with, with one parent. Um, so as a breeder, you gotta have to look at all these cordyceps and say like, oh, these are the traits. Like it's you know it's a, it's a little nuanced, uh, but after a while you'll start to understand what you're looking at. Um, so if you just want to grow cordyceps, you don't necessarily need to know any of this. It's just information that I think would be good to add because I've done this talk four times <laughs> at Telluride, and I want to just keep hitting y'all with the new stuff because otherwise you can just watch the recordings from the previous years. Um, so yeah. We're in here just isolating new genetics. Um, and why do we love cordyceps? They produce interesting compounds um, that make humans feel nice. Um, we like cordycepin. Cordycepin uh, gives us energy. It gives us energy on a cellular level. It gives us energy in a way that feels more natural than caffeine. Um, it also can uh, help in getting more oxygen into our body. Um, it is, uh, has anti-cancer properties. And there's more and more, uh, there's more research coming out uh, over the years showing that cordycepin and cordymin, another uh, species-specific unique compound. Species-specific unique compounds in mushrooms generally will start with the same name of the mushroom. So you see it says cordycepin, cordymin, cordyxanthins. It's all cordy. These are uh, compounds that are specifically novel to uh, cordyceps mushrooms. What up, bam. We got fam in the building, big link up. Um, so yeah, uh, species specific unique compounds, this is where we're gonna be uh, finding a lot of um, medicinal interests and a lot of ecological interests, or uh, economical interests into the future. Um, but cordycepin and cordymin have been shown, um, and I believe we'll find more and more research showing uh, their benefit uh, to be effective against retroviruses. So the research right now has shown that cordycepin and cordymin individually and in combination um, are capable of inhibiting HIV-1 reverse transcriptase. So that's pretty freaking cool. Um, and I think that this will be something that will be looked at more and more into the future, as well as uh, Cordis. I don't know if any of y'all have seen the research. Um, sorry about the water, y'all, but it's a mushroom festival. I hope y'all love it. Um, uh, cordyceps, there's, there's been some interesting research about cordyceps and COVID. I don't know what's the legal legality about talking about stuff like that. I get flagged every time anything comes up on the internet, but um, cordyceps seem to have some benefits uh, 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 with COVID. So more, more, more y'all should just look into that on your own. Um, cordyxanthins are some of these uh, novel pigment compounds. Uh, we have interesting orange and yellow pigments uh, that come out of these cordyceps um, that are in these cordyxanthins. Uh, we have cordycepine. I honestly don't know much about cordycepine and cordyland. Um, there are other novel compounds that, you know, deserve more research. Um, so yeah, let's get into some cultivation stuff. Um, this information is all available on the internet, as I mentioned. Um, I have a YouTube channel, Apex Grower, hundreds of videos. Um, check out my Instagram, I have links through my bio for my book, free downloads, I'll put it back up for Telluride stuff. Um, but if you guys do want my book, um, let's see, do I have one with me? Yeah, y'all can pass this one around and look at it, but if y'all want this, it'll be back in print at the end of next month. Um, maybe 
maybe um, mid, wait, what is it? Yeah, maybe mid October at the latest, but I'm getting those back in print. Um, so yeah, this is the bag technique. This is one that's often utilized. Um, often utilized with silicone bags as well for, re for the reusability, um, where you'll sterilize your grain um, and some people will inoculate right into the bag and allow it to uh, incubate and inoculate in the, or uh, myceliate in the bag. I don't like the word colonize, it's a little ugly. Let's uh, remove that from, from the mushroom world. My, my catchphrase for the past 10 years has been propagate myceliate. Let's grow, baby. Uh, but uh, yeah, so we got the grains in the bag and um, some people will inoculate and let it colonize in their bag or myceliate in the bag. Um, and some people will uh, uh, introduce their liquid culture and then spread it out into a bigger container and allow it to myceliate through the bigger container. Um, so, let's continue. Um, this is, y'all can take pictures of this if you'd like. I'll talk about it a little bit. Um, when we're growing cordyceps, uh, we're not using insects. So I'm sure a lot of y'all have been wondering this the whole time, like do we need bugs to grow these mushrooms? No. Um, cordyceps, it, Militaris is one of the most successful cordyceps because it can grow on so many different species as I mentioned before. Um, and because of this, I, I believe this is why it takes so readily to growing on synthetic substrates. Um, so what I did initially was um, I got, a, I got a, a translated Thai recipe from my buddy Ryan. Um, I watched a bunch of Asian YouTube videos that I couldn't understand what they were saying, and I tried to figure out what the heck they were putting in their substrates. Um, so I started off by like, because I would watch the videos, they'd be boiling potatoes, they get rid of the potatoes, they mix like baby food in the water, like eggs, milk, a bunch of weird stuff. Um, and I, try, I started trying out all of it, um, and eventually I refined it back. Um, but it was like in 2017 um, that I linked up with my buddy Kevin Bachhuber, who ran Big Cricket Farms in Youngston, Ohio, which was the first USDA certified organic insect farm for human consumption in the United States. And he gave me the nutritional profile of mealworms and crickets, and then I reverse engineered their nutritional profile with a bunch of shit I could find on the internet, um, and made a nutrient recipe. Um, and then afterwards, um, as I wrote my second book, I started looking at a bunch of research papers on hyperproduction or overproduction of uh, beneficial compounds in cordyceps mushrooms, um, and I started to develop this nutrient recipe, uh, which has proved in time and time again to uh, yield high uh, um, weight mushrooms and beautiful looking mushrooms. So uh, generally what we're gonna need is a simple sugar, I'll use malt, a complex sugar, I'll use a starch like tapioca starch, potato starch, um, and then uh, we'll need a protein. Uh, that protein breaks down into nitrogen and then a lot of the compounds are nitrogenous based or nitrogen based, like the cordycepin. Um, so for the protein, I'll use uh, peptone or I'll use nutritional yeast. Um, you can use milk or egg. Use matrix or as a solid state substrate for the mind. After we add the protein, after we add the simple sugar and the complex sugar, um, then we add our minerals. Um, so we've been playing around with adding like vitamin, multivitamin tablets and stuff like that into our uh, mixes. Um, but we'll use like kelp powder, gypsum, rock dust, um, things like that. I have played around with gibberellic acid recently um, over the past couple of years and found that it does stimulate mycelial growth, uh, which is really interesting because it's a plant hormone. Um, and selenite. Selenite is, uh, cordyceps do love, love selenite. Um, so this rice cooker instant pot technique is uh, very easy for beginners to start out with and my buddy Ryan Gates has an amazing YouTube video on how to do this technique. Um, also, if you want to go down the rabbit hole that I went down when I first started this, look up Tawat Tapping K. It's T-A-W-A-T-T-A-P-I-N-G-K-A-E. Uh, his amazing YouTube channel features all sorts of videos um, from rural permaculture in uh, Thailand. Um, your mind will be blown with the other stuff that they're doing besides cordyceps, but that's where I figured out a lot of this stuff. Um, it's not in English. Uh, just get real stoned and vibe out and listen and speak in, in Thai. It's so it's so interesting. Um, that that's how I did it. I'm not gonna lie. Um, everybody asks. Everybody wants to solve. So I'm like, yo, I got high and I watch YouTube. Um, but yeah, so uh, Jartech, Jartech, tried and true. It works really good. It's super reliable. It's super clean. Um, it, the substrate cooks, sterilizes all in the jar, you introduce in the jar, you don't open it again until you harvest. Um, more and more people are stepping away from this as they're getting into bulk cultivation. People are cultivating in like bins, uh, plastic bins and things like this. Um, I did a lot of experimentation with bulk cultivation um, at my farm in Weaverville, North Carolina in 2017, 2018. I started the first commercial cordyceps farm in the United States um, and for that brief moment in time, I was the only one with domestic cordyceps in the United States that sold for $1,400 a pound. Uh, that based that price off cordyceps prices internationally. Um, 
And, uh, you know, that lasted for a little bit, but, you know, uh, the market, the free market uh, stimulates economic growth, stimulates industry um, by lowering prices and automating and things like that, which is, you know, brings us to points where we have bigger styles of cultivation where individuals can step into this and start off, you know, growing a significant amount. So the prices now are like between six and 800, depending on the aesthetic. You know, you can't sell me some cordyceps with grains all over them that are beat up looking, you know, the market's becoming educated now. Um, so these are what the farms look like in uh, Asia. Um, we have fully air conditioned farms, lots of air movement, lights really close to the jars, clear lids because cordyceps are photosensitive and they will grow towards the light. They need light stimulation in order to grow. Um, uh, so the air movement keeps them from getting hot. Cordyceps like to be 65 degrees. Uh, my buddy at Andrew Adirondack Mycology, Darren or Jaren at Adirondack Mycology, uh, last year he went around putting a soil probe in the ground every time he found a cordyceps in, uh, uh, in the Adirondacks, and he measured average temperature for what the te uh, ground temp is where the cordyceps are growing. Um, and this, you know, correlates with what we've discovered, which took me two years of trying to figure out why these cordyceps weren't growing in the summer and only growing in the winter time, um, that they like to be at 65 degrees. Um, so it wasn't until 2017 that I realized that they like to be at 65 degrees right before I published my first book, because I couldn't figure out why they wouldn't grow all year. Um, and I would see stuff like this about uh, in Thailand people growing, or in, uh, yeah, in, Th in Thailand people growing them outside, and I'm just like, what? Like, it's hot out there. Um, so I don't, I don't understand. There's a lot of things I still don't understand about the Asian cultivation I need to get over there. Um, a lot of their cultures are sterile. They don't even produce spore or parathesium at all. Um, so this is uh, like some pictures from my first closet um, back in 20, uh, uh, no, so, no, this isn't even my first closet. This is my first experiments with bulk um, in different light spectrums. Um, so my first experiments with bulk cultivation, I did them in, uh, in um, aluminum pans. Um, I, I, back when I first started growing mushrooms when I was like 16, um, I watched a bunch of videos from Amsterdam and there was this guy that would grow uh, psilocybin mushrooms on popcorn in, in aluminum pans. And he would put aluminum foil over the pans with the popcorn and the liquid in there and then he put it in the pressure cooker and then he stick a liquid, he stick a liquid culture syringe in the top and let the mycelium grow in there. And then he pull off the aluminum foil and then let the mushrooms grow out. And I was like, yo, that will work great for cordyceps. So I did it, but then everybody was like, yo, you're gonna get aluminum in your cordyceps mushrooms. They're gonna eat through the pan and all this kind of stuff. I never seen them eat through the pan, but I also haven't, do, I haven't done the research that shows that they're not accumulating aluminum. So I stopped doing that pretty early on because I was dependent on the, the income from the cordyceps to even perpetuate doing this weird research when I had a two-year-old baby that needed my, my time and energy more than this. Um, well, you know, apparently not, because now we're here vibing out, my little seven-year-old is running around having the time of his fucking life. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so uh, this is where we started experimenting with the blue and red. Uh, we found some research showing that blue and red light stimulated uh, higher cordycepin production in mycelium. A lot of the research is based on mycelium because um, a lot of the medical uh, interests are interested more in the compounds and it takes like 55 days to get full fruiting bodies when you can produce mycelium, producing high levels of these compounds on a regular basis, like every couple of days be pulling massive amounts of these compounds out. So a lot of the research is uh, specifically focused on mycelium, but it does translate over to the fruiting bodies as well. Um, so yeah, these, this is my first inbred strain that produced d decent yields. Um, I was getting like three to five grams dry per pint jar. Uh, which was pretty good whenever I was getting like, what, like, like uh, between three and five dollars a gram back then. Um, so yeah, um, this was a, some of my first bulk cultivation uh, was on millet. I don't like millet, I don't like small grains um, because they tend to stick during harvest and when you're doing commercial harvest, you're harvesting a lot, you don't want grains sticking in there because then it ruins the aesthetic. It also ruins the, I don't want to say terroir, um, but um, as an individual that has taken so much psychedelics and looked inside and become so sensitive of uh, things that I that I'd sense. Um, when I eat stuff, I can taste where it's been. When I, when I drink stuff, when I smoke hash and things like that, I can taste where it's been. Like if it was in a warehouse, if it was in a cardboard box or whatever. And I've tasted cordyceps tea from a bag of cordyceps that has grains in it. It tastes like the grains. It's sitting in a bag of grains. That, that smell, if you open a bag of grains, it's gonna smell like grains. That smell is in there with your bag of cordyceps, infusing all with your bag of cordyceps. So it's ruining the, the value of it at the end of the day. But there aren't, that many, there aren't that many people that are nuanced or sensitive enough to sense this kind of stuff. Everybody's all loaded up on coffee, cigarettes, and needs like super concentrated hash oil and all sorts of things to even feel anything anymore. Um, 
But yeah, this is the life we lead. This is the life we lead. Everybody wants these concentrated extracts for everything nowadays because we can't feel nothing. Let's uh, resensitize ourselves. Um, but yeah, uh, so these are what they look like when they're mature. Uh, you're gonna wanna wait till they're mature before you harvest them. This is something I didn't know when I first started cultivating. Uh, when the parathecium are all bumpy on the top and they pop out like, uh, that's when it's really mature. They'll start out real, real small, the little bumps on the top. The mushroom will grow up, then you'll start to see the bumps, and then they'll get real big and expressed, or erect. Um, so yeah, here we have some more mature, uh, nice erect, open parathecium. You can see, I don't know if y'all can see from that far away, but it almost looks like, like coral or something. You can see the pore is open. Um, that's super mature, ready to harvest. If you don't harvest at that time, uh, there is a fungus that somehow goes through the breeding process. We call it like an endofungal uh, symbiont. I don't even know what the heck the thing is. It's called cordy Calcarosporium cordycipicola. We don't know how it lives with the cordyceps all the time, but if it goes above 70 degrees or if you don't harvest in time, it grows all over your cordyceps. Um, so yeah, uh, we see all sorts of different genetic variation uh, when we cultivate them uh, that we wouldn't see in the wild because they're not exposed to wind, rain, uh, uh, animals walking around, stuff like that. So you'll see them grow crazy forms, um, crazy beautiful forms. Um, this is a uh, Aster Place. I actually sold these to um, a chef. I can't remember his name. Chef PV or something like that. You can look him up on YouTube. Chef PV Insect something. He has like a show, a YouTube show on cooking insects. Um, and uh, they wanted to buy cordyceps. All these rich people, they, so some magazine or something, were having a bug party. All these rich people were like eating bugs on top on this big apartment in Manhattan, and they wanted to buy cordyceps to make these little like like. Uh, mealworm tarts with mushroom, of course that's mushroom on top. Um, but yeah, I took this picture and everybody's like, oh, you're gonna destroy the insect populations in New York or you're gonna infect humans or blah, blah, blah. So I'm just like, y'all, you don't watch too much TV. Um, so when I first started uh, dehydrating them when I was growing at a small scale, um, I would dehydrate them on paper towels overnight with a little fan blowing around, dehydrate overnight. Um, when I started to get into uh, more cultivation, I started to dehydrate with a fan with the fan in the back. Uh, the fan that comes down on the dehydrators is not good when you have big piles of cordyceps. Only the ones on the tops get dry and the ones on the bottom don't get dry all the way. Um, so the ones with the fans in the back are better, uh, but I think freeze drying is gonna be the future of, of uh, uh, compound preservation uh, in the mushrooms. It also makes it look way cooler. It looks like it's still fresh. Um, so a lot of my students have been successful. This is one of my students' farms in upstate New York. Uh, they bought a school um, and now grow cordyceps in a bunch of school, old classrooms. Um, this was uh, you know, a lot of trials and errors that led to the books that I wrote. Uh, in, this was in Weaverville, North Carolina at my first uh, large scale grow. Um, so yeah, I learned a lot there. I got to the point where I was harvesting five pounds a month um, at, you know, $1,300, $1,400 a pound is what I was selling them at when I was the only one doing it. So I was like literally living in this warehouse by myself, inoculating jars all day, sterilizing jars all day, cleaning jars all day. Um, I was on probation, so I didn't have nothing else to do. I couldn't even get stoned. Um, no, I don't, well, we use jars sometimes when we're doing uh, genetic testing and stuff like that. Yeah, I was on probation for weed. I didn't do nothing like actually bad. Um, but yeah, uh, so yeah, it was, uh, uh, I only use jars for um, trial for trial runs, just for the like, because it's easy. We know it's going to work every single time, and um, the yield rates that we get on the pint jars are like are standardized. Like you know, if, if it's less than three grams per dry per pint jar, then I'm not messing with it. It's not worth my time. Um, well, it might be. You know, it might have something interesting going on, but you know, as far as the current market goes, that's what we're looking at. Um, so yeah, that's, these are some of the first harvests that I started getting that were big. You can see like little bits of grains and shit all over the bottoms and on it. I didn't know what I was doing, I was ripping them off. Like, it took a while to figure out how to harvest them good. You don't want to cut them off either because they'll bruise black if you put pressure and cut them. So you want to pull them off by hand. So it's like, that's the price. This is a hand harvested thing. If it's not hand harvested, you'll be able to tell. Um, so that's when I really dialed it in. That was really when I was like, oh man, I have some beautiful organisms in my hands. And uh, yeah, that was a really interesting turning point for all of cordyceps cultivation. Um, and a big part of my work personally um, is influencing culture on the broadest scale as I possibly can. Um, I was born onto a planet and quickly recognize the potentials of the multidimensional human being that I was and all the potentials of the multidimensional humans around me. And it felt like I was living in the dark ages. I'm like, 
Why are we still using fossil fuels? Why are we still killing each other? Why don't we have gardens everywhere? Why aren't we like sending people out into space instead of rich dudes sending themselves out into space? Like, what is this? Like, and I knew the potentials because I tripped myself out and broke through space time and saw all the potentials of reality. Nobody would stop me from doing that. You know, I was able to explore those luxuries at a young age. And now I see that the most important and the most effective way to influence mass population is through popular culture. Um, and I've been able to accumulate some hundreds of thousands of followers on the internet by doing weird shit like this. And now there's a bunch of kids in school, K through 12, that I talk to on a regular basis all around the world that are looking up to this because I'm on TikTok. Straight up. I know I'm doing, like this ain't, this ain't just for fun and games. Like there's culture curation behind all of this. I'm permaculture poppy. This is some big design. <laughs> y'all, y'all will see. One day, one day I'll be real old, and y'all kid, y'all's kids will be like, "Oh shit, that man really tripped the fuck out." <laughs> but yeah, now it's all games. It's, it's all fun and games. But we're out here having fun and really doing some really important work. Um, so yeah, now we're getting into the extracts. Um, I recommend you guys go check out my buddy James. He's really passionate about this. He's taken over uh, cordyceps extraction and other mushroom extraction for mycosymbiotics. Um, we did start out doing a lot of like soxalate extraction. Uh, we're now affiliated with the company uh, Extract Craft. They're based out of Colorado. Um, they have ethanol recovery machines that we've been utilizing uh, to recover ethanol from our cordyceps extracts and create these concentrated extracts that are highly bioactive orally. I know some of y'all are on them right now. Raise your hands. Yeah. How y'all feeling? Vibing. Vibing. All right. So yeah, um, these are highly concentrated. The the, the I, uh, cordyceps lines me. Cordyceps, lion's mane, and reishi concentrated extracts are the most biologically active substances that I've ever consumed that are not regulated. Um, hands down, like you put, you feel it. It's like people are like, "Yo, you feel it? Like you feel anything? Like yeah, you feel something." Um, so yeah, we've been uh, you know experimenting with like sublingual. These, a lot of these are water soluble. Um, we're ex we're experimenting with different solvents. Um, and you know now the, the world is opening up, the research is opening up, the tools are opening us up for us to figure out what we're looking at, what we're doing, what we're playing with. Uh, we're really like you know breaking down and discovering the building blocks of life, really. Um, and it's so interesting to me as a biologist, as a as a. Uh, self-realized human being, and I hope that all of us become self-realized human beings because all self-realized human beings will realize that they are the ultimate scientific tool designed by nature. Um, that, I mean, like, every single organism, Terence McKenna said it best, like, uh, as human beings being that ultimate scientific tool that I said, we're more capable of understanding uh, symbolic linguistic structures over auditory linguistic structures. It's embedded in our DNA. That's why a little baby can recognize that sharp teeth are scary and claws are scary, or little babies can uh, communicate through emojis before they can communicate through auditory or, script or written language. Um, and Terence McKenna said it best, that DNA is, is protein syntax uttering itself into existence. So all of these forms that we're looking at are pure linguistic symbols telling us about what the hell life is in front of us all the time. And, and behind that, now that we're looking at the spirit of it, what's actually the essence of these life forms, we're seeing more layers of the ecological function. These, all, all these things are being produced for a specific reason. Every single thing has been evolved and morphed around the, the, the stimuli around it, around the other life forms around it. They are producing these compounds specifically for things that they were evolved around. Why? Why do they produce these compounds that are so active in the human being? Um, yeah, so I'm, I think I'm gonna wrap this up. I think I got like seven more minutes. I wanna give you guys some uh, time for questions and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I've done some crazy experiments over the days. Um, cacao, it's an aphrodisiac, super dope. I really love aphrodisiacs because, I mean, I, I, they're tight, like aphrodisiacs are tight. I mean, it's part of like this biological function. I am like, I, I am that I am. I am self-realized ecological function. Every single human being, every single one of your DNA codes is an ecological function that has a purpose. It has a, a function. Um, so I think it's really cool to play around with our biological functions and explore those biological functions. Um, so yeah, cacao, really beautiful aphrodisiac. Um, I was able to get uh, cacao trades from Miami Fruit uh, back in the day. Pretty cool company, they popped off over the past couple years. Um, but they sell fruit on the internet, and I was trading them cordyceps for cacao pods. And I would take the cacao pods with the fruit on it, and I would put 
a little bit of rice and water in a jar with the cacao beans, with the fruit on it still, and then I would, I would sterilize it, and I would utilize cordyceps to ferment the cacao beans, because cacao beans need to be fermented before you make chocolate with them. Um, and I was able to even grow cordyceps mushrooms off the cacao beans, which I thought was super, super sexy. Like, it's like a, they, they, I mean, they grow on like a little a moth pupa, and it's like a, a cacao bean. Like, what the, like, that's crazy. But, um, so anyways, we had, you can see the mycelium completely infused through the beans there. Um, and then we were able to dehydrate the beans and make chocolate with it. Um, some of the other methods of consumption, teas, uh, cons uh, consuming the fruit bodies. Uh, we did used to eat the mycelium before we, uh, I wouldn't recommend eating mycelium from fruited my, uh, blocks. It's 55 days that this mycelium has been exposed to the environment and it will, it can and will harbor uh, pathogens. Mycelium that is produced at scale uh, for consumption is done in FDA regulated laboratories that I've been able to have the luxury to ex experience. They're very clean. This isn't just something that people can, should or could just be doing in their homes just yet. Uh, but the technological prowess is, uh, and the linguistics are coming uh, with the events like this and more and more people becoming educated about this kind of stuff. Um, but my, eating mycelium can be a little sketchy for, for human beings. It, they make harbor pathogens. Um, uh, if, after they've been fruited for 55 days. Um, so we don't eat the mycelium anymore, but we do eat the fruiting bodies a lot. Uh, this is a cold water extraction. Um, cordyceps Fresh will do a cold water extract in like six hours. You can straight just put the mushroom in the water and you will see stuff come out of it, like almost instantly. It's that available. That is, it gets to the point where, I mean, I'm, so, I'm sure some of y'all recognize it took the extract, but even in the mushroom form, it's a, it's a bioactive sublingual. You only have to swallow it. It'll, the compounds will go into your your little whatever. Your, I don't know what's the technical term for the, the mucus glands or mucal membranes. Yeah, that's that shit. Um, yeah, so uh, we'll pickle them sometimes. We'll make pizzas. Um, a lot of, when I first started selling the cordyceps, I was like, what do I do with it? I'm like, yo, it's a mushroom. Figure out, you're a human being. Like, we found this in the woods. You put, cook it, put it on fire, you know, make it, do something with it. So I was like, all right, let me just tell everybody. I'm going to put a pickle. I'm going to put a pickle. I'm going to put a pizza. I'm going to put it in my soup. You know, I post it on the internet so everybody stops asking me these questions. Um, no, nah, I'm just kidding. I love y'all. Um, but yeah, uh, we did a cold water extract popsicles. Uh, that, that worked out pretty cool. Uh, that was with mom and ice pops up in New York. Um, this was with the gnome. Um, again, we are not individuals. There is no need for one business to be doing everything. Why are you making all these damn products when there's a, a company that is specialized in making that product? I send my cordyceps off to homies that make hot sauce. I send my cordyceps off to homies that make holistic syrups. I, I send my cordyceps off to people who make popsicles. I don't do any of those things. I don't want to do any of those things. I, I just want to do what I want to do and send it off so everybody can explore their own passions and we can play together. Um, yeah, I love playing with my friends. I love giving my friends opportunities to play with me. Um, and uh, yeah, this is mixing up the cordyceps extract into coconut oil. They're better water soluble, but this does work. Um, and then we made some really cool chocolates. Um, I don't know if we have these available, but we do have some really cool stuff available up there. Gold dusted mushroom concentrate infused chocolates. Yo, have y'all been taking notes? I'm not. I Take my ideas and make yourself successful businesses. There are individuals here that have already taken my ideas and made themselves successful businesses. I have given myself for this purpose. Um, this is really cool, designer eggs. Um, there is uh, myriad research showing um, that chickens fed cordyceps waster media, is what it's called if you wanna look it up yourself, um, can increase yolk mass, decrease cholesterol, and introduce cordycepin into the yolk. Um, so you can get your cordyceps concentrate, uh, your cordyceps compounds through an egg from the material that you wouldn't have been able to eat yourself. Um, the other things that I started doing with the chickens, because I grow algae, y'all should go look into the work aside from this, because this is just one part of a big permaculture design. Um, but yeah, I grow algae as well, and you can feed the algae that gets contaminated and everything every now and then to the chickens. It increases the omega content in their eggs, because um, the algae is producing those omegas. Um, and then you feed them shit loads of spicy peppers and that yolk turns red. So you get big fat red cordycepin yolks that are high in omega fatty acids, designer eggs. Business idea, go, let's go. Um, so yeah, uh, here we have Ophiocordyceps cephalicola. Uh, this is one that can be found distributed up all up and down the east coast. Um, this one I believe will yield interesting biopesticide uh, um, um, results um, as it grows on wasps. Um, and then on the right, we have Talipocladium ophioglossoides, um, which has research showing that um, it is beneficial for prostate cancer. Um, and experiences from my friends 
um, myself and light research um, showing its nootropic benefits. Uh, my friends and myself for years have been consuming this mushroom because it's abundant in our forest. Um, and you know, us sensitive humans that are focusing our senses and our consciousness inward instead of being stimulated outward and being desensitized and all that kind of stuff, can feel stuff in our bodies. This is what this is literally like. I, it might sound pretentious or some shit, but like this is how the old yogis and all the ancient Vedas and all the old Chinese traditional medicine that we look at is because they were sensitive of their bodies when they ate something. They know what it did and what organ. They're like, oh, this is affecting my liver right now. Like we don't even know nothing. We're all backed up and like full of crap. <laughs> Not all of us. Y'all are a good crowd. Y'all are a real good crowd. If y'all made it here, you got the good shit in your brain to even have gotten yourselves here. This is a vortex. And, and it has drawn your energy in. Um, yeah, the founders of Telluride knew what they were doing. They were tripped the fuck out. They knew. <laughs> and all that means is that they were experiencing the present moment. It might take a little bit more for each of us, depending on how far gone we let ourselves go. But all those substances do is help you and, and it gives you your own individual unique experience, shows you your own pretty little colors, your own pretty little lights, your own pretty little sounds that makes the present moment beautiful for you. So you can get yourself back into the moment and stop being so caught up elsewhere. Um, and then you can be happy boy growing five pounds of dry cordyceps every month. Um, so yeah, that was at the farm back in North Carolina as I worked on developing standards of practice with other farmers on how we harvest these, how we maintain them afterwards, and all these kinds of things. Because as much as fun and games this is, this is serious. I introduced a whole new mushroom to agriculture. Like, I, in Pennsylvania, we have a whole mushroom department for the U Department of Agriculture that's still trying to assess and figure out how to put this into the agricultural uh, department systems to, to monitor this. Because they, they have whole, they have sent, uh, send us lists in the mail. All the mushroom farmers in Pennsylvania get lists sent in the mail. How many mushrooms of which species did you produce? And cordyceps isn't even on the list yet. Um, and whenever I first started doing this, the, uh, when the USDA reps came out to certify my kitchen for processing, uh, they didn't even know what to say that I was doing. They gave me a license that said I was making bread. <laughs> yeah. Luckily, I was conscious because I, if, I, if I didn't know what I was doing and like was touch, and handling this improperly, they didn't know what I was doing either. I could have been selling contaminated stuff. You know, this is like this is really important that we take this seriously. This is a real industry, and this is medicine. This is like this is stuff. This is something that somebody might be taking because they're might die or are or, or, or having severe illnesses. Um, so yeah, and I've been teaching everybody since the moment I figured this shit out. As soon as I cloned the cordyceps, I offered it to the internet for free. Only 20 people asked for it. I sell hundreds of cultures a month now. So I mean, here we go, you know. Um, it's, it's, it's really, really time to share um, because anything can happen at any point in time and one person could have some crazy novel idea in their head that could revolutionize humanity, but because they wanted to save it for themselves and capitalize on it themselves, dies with them, and humanity doesn't get to benefit from it. So like, you know, share, please, because it creates community, it creates vibrance, and we can all grow together. Um, so yeah, I've been teaching these classes for years. Um, teaching these classes to people like you, hopefully inspiring and providing uh, energy exchange um, so that you all can propagate these kinds of things into your own lives. Um, and end up with really cool cordyceps like that so that you can consume them, uh, gain those benefits, uh, take that energy and sh share it around uh, your family and your community. Um, so yeah, thanks for listening. Yeah, I can, I can answer some questions if anybody has some questions. Yep. It grows very well in liquid media, very fast in liquid media. You can even fruit in liquid media. Um, and I haven't done the analytics, but almost all of the analytical research that's available online has been done on uh, solid state fermentation and liquid fermentation. So you can find loads of information on that uh, if you just go on Google Scholar. I think I read in the book, I like to go 12-12 uh, for my fruiting of cordyceps, and I like to do that just to conserve energy. Because um, some people keep their lights on all the time, and it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not detrimental. I don't know if it's necessarily beneficial, um, but I don't see any like, like faster growth if the lights on or longer or anything like that. What projects are you looking forward to most this next year? 
living and not working on anything. Yeah. I, for the past 10 years, like since I, literally since I did psychedelics and realized that I didn't want to participate in the rest of this bullshit um, when I was like 17, since then I've been working so hard so I didn't have to work. And like I finally did that and like, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, I want to work till I'm retired or I'm older or whatever, but like I have a kid and like all I want to do is spend time with him. All he needs from me is for me to spend time with him and not be working. So like that's what I want to do. That's what I'm most looking forward to. Yeah. All right, I gotta go. Uh, much love. We'll be around. Woo!